It's good to see so many of you here this morning. Uh, you know that in our church we have majored for many years on knowing the distinction between the new covenant and the old covenant. But sometimes that can be a, something we just say very lightly without understanding how serious it is or we don't understand all the implications of it. The important thing is not to speak about it or to use those words, new covenant, old covenant, and not even to glory in it, but to actually live in it. I want to show you some, a verse uh, from 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 speaks a lot about the difference between the two covenants. The old covenant was made with Israel on Mount Sinai when Moses was the mediator between God and Israel. The new covenant was made on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came upon the, the first church of 120 people and Jesus is the mediator between God the Father and us. There's a lot of difference. If you want to know how much better is the new covenant than the old covenant that is as much better as Jesus is than Moses. That's how much. So the possibility of a new covenant life is as much higher as Jesus is than Moses. But in 2 Corinthians 3, 9, there are two expressions describing these two covenants. Verse 9, uh, the the old covenant is called the ministry of condemnation. And it said even that had a glory because verse 7, when Moses came down from the mountain, there was a glory on his face. But, it says in verse 7, it was a glory that was fading away. In other words, when he came down from God's presence, there was a glory. But as time went on, that glory in his face began to dim and dim and dim and dim. That's why he put a veil over his face, it says here, so that people would not see, verse 13, so that people would not see that this glory is decreasing. And that's one mark of people who live under the old covenant. They have to cover the fact that the glory in their life is decreasing from what it was once. That's what it says here. He put a veil on his face, verse 13, so that people would not see that underneath that veil, the face, the glory was decreasing and decreasing. And if you find in your life that some glory that you experienced in the Christian life once upon a time is decreasing and decreasing and you try to cover it up in some way or the other, that is one mark that you're really living under the old covenant because you're living before the face of men. They live before the face of men in the Old Covenant. But in the New Covenant, we live before the face of God. God sees us through and through. There's nothing to hide. But the thing I want to emphasize is in verse 9, it's called a ministry of condemnation, whereas the New Covenant is called a ministry of righteousness, and it abounds in glory. I feel that a lot of us who hear the Word of God in this church live under condemnation many times and condemnation self-condemnation is not the same as the conviction of the Holy Spirit it's very important to understand that conviction of the Holy Spirit is when we do something wrong you spoke a bad word or an angry word or you had a dirty thought or you hurt somebody in some way or you gossiped or spoke evil, something that you did or spoke or thought and you're convicted immediately, hey, that was wrong. If you're sensitive to the Holy Spirit, you'll feel it immediately. If you're not sensitive to the Holy Spirit, you may feel it only when somebody preaches about it, which means you're not sensitive, but when somebody preaches about it, then you sort of get alert, which is second best, it's better than nothing. Some people don't even get convicted even after they hear a message. That's worse. 
But if you get convicted when you hear a message, that's second best. The best is to be convicted as soon as you do something wrong. Conviction. But conviction of the Holy Spirit is very different from condemnation. It is not God's will that we should ever live under self-condemnation. Not even for a moment. And yet I know that born-again Christians can live under self-condemnation because I lived like that for many years after I was born again till I knew that in the new covenant there is no condemnation. The opposite of condemnation is righteousness. Not my own righteousness. Because if I live with my own righteousness, I'll condemn myself all the time. But because I have truly turned from my old life, and if this applies to you, then it's true of you as well. If you can say to the best of my knowledge, I really want to give up that old way of life where I live for myself and sin. I'm not perfect, but I've changed direction. Repentance means just change direction. Now I really want to follow the Lord and seek to please Him. And if that is your goal, there is no need for condemnation. If you are quick to confess a sin as soon as you are convicted of it, there is no need for condemnation. Because the righteousness of Christ clothes us as soon as we confess and turn around from our sin and ask the Lord to cleanse us in the blood of Jesus. So think of that word, condemnation and righteousness, two very important words, the righteousness of Christ or condemnation. You can't have both. In Romans, in chapter 5, the word of God has given us to set us free from every type of bondage. In Romans 5, it says here that we are justified by his blood, in verse 9, declared righteous. And it goes on to speak about Adam's sin when we were in Adam and we are in Christ, in verse 18. Through one transgression, let's begin at verse 17, by the transgression of one, that is Adam, death reigned over all men. If so, then those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life. There it was death that was reigning. Now it is life that will reign. And that one transgression resulted in condemnation. Again that word, condemnation. But through Jesus, there results one act of righteousness, there results justification. Now the great danger of condemning ourselves is first of all, I mean, you, you see yourself, supposing you're condemning yourself because you think that you're being more holy by saying, oh, well, I'm so good for nothing and there's nothing good in me and all that, and you stop there. And the result of that is you ultimately, people who condemn themselves usually tend to condemn other people as well. You tend to have a spirit of accusation where you see something in somebody and you immediately condemn him without even finding out the facts. Do you find that in your life, that you hear something about somebody and you immediately condemn that person? Oh, he was like that. That's the result of people who live under condemnation themselves. Because if you live under the love of God, um, rejoicing in how God is so merciful to us, we will be merciful to others. But if I always feel God is condemning me and he's always looking at me in a very angry way, what happens is we become like that. There's a verse in the Psalms that says, those who worship idols become like them. So if I worship a false god, by false god I don't mean some other god, I mean a wrong picture of Jesus, a wrong picture of our Heavenly Father is a false God. You can call it Jesus, but it's not the real Jesus. 
It's a Jesus who's very angry with you all the time and who's looking down upon you with a frown and condemning you. That's a wrong Jesus. It's another Jesus. The Bible speaks of another Jesus. You're worshipping a false god. And what happens is, you worship that god long enough, you'll become like him. You'll become condemning and accusing others without knowing all the facts, etc. Very quick to condemn. That's what the Pharisees were. The Pharisees were very quick to condemn people. And there was no mercy there at all. See, in John chapter 8, the classic example of the Pharisees bringing a woman caught in adultery. And what it says in Romans, sorry, John 8, 3, the scribes and Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery and having set her in the center. See, they delighted in something. They were so proud of the fact that I didn't get caught in adultery. I mean, these guys must have been committing adultery in their mind. Nobody was there to catch them. But they were quick to pounce on somebody else who they found, hey, he's doing something wrong. And they said, we got to condemn this person. And they brought her to condemn her. And they brought her to Jesus because they knew Jesus is a very compassionate person. Jesus had already got a reputation as a very compassionate person, merciful, forgiving. And they're wondering what he's going to do now when he, this person has violated the law. They thought they could catch Jesus and trip him up and prove to people this person is not. Moses said, person who commits adultery must be stoned to death, but this person is not obeying that law. That was their aim. Their aim was to condemn Jesus himself. But you can't catch Jesus. He caught them in their, their trick and he said, okay, okay. If she has to be stoned, if any of you is without sin, throw the first stone. Go right ahead. And he didn't say anything more. One sentence. That is the word the father gave him. And it says here in verse 9, when they heard it, they went away one by one. Because their heart told them, you can't throw a stone. Look at the things you've done wrong. Do you hear that voice? When you are tempted to throw a stone at somebody in words? Do you hear a voice saying, are you qualified to throw a stone at that person? Think about it. These Pharisees were at least honest. They said, no, we are not qualified, and they went away one by one. But they did want to condemn her. And Jesus used that same word, condemn, in verse 10. Then Jesus, when they'd all left, he said, Woman, where are they? No one to condemn you? He said, No one, Lord. He said, I don't condemn you either. Now, remember, what Jesus said was, If there's anyone here without sin, obey the word of God and throw the stone. There was one person without sin. That was Jesus. He could have obeyed the Old Testament law which said, stone that woman so that people take adultery seriously. This is one of those examples where Jesus did not obey the letter of the law. See, those who are legalists are very careful about the letter of the law. Usually on other people, you, are they keeping the letter of the law? They're very quick to condemn others Maybe a sister who doesn't veil her head in the meeting or someone wears a little extra jewelry or something. Quick to condemn because you see, I don't do that. And you'll find such people, I'm not saying they become evil, but they're like people who get 100% in kindergarten, always. They say, I'm okay. But you're still in the kindergarten after 20 years. What's the use glorying that you get 100% if you're still in the kindergarten. It's better to get 80% in first standard than to keep on getting 100% in kindergarten. That means there's no growth there. Quick to condemn others and not aware of sin within oneself. So Jesus, he, we can say he violated the letter of the law, but he kept the spirit because God loved the world. God loved the world. He didn't give the law to condemn people. He gave the law to save people. 
And we must remember when we look at the commandments in the New Testament also, they are not commands with which you have to hit somebody on the head with. Why aren't you doing this? It's so easy to do that. And when you, if you have, find that attitude in your heart, I want to say, my brothers and sisters, it's possible that you're living under the old covenant where you're, you're living under condemnation and that's why you are quick to condemn others. It's a great example, that story, where Jesus said, I don't condemn you. It doesn't mean I tolerate your sin. He said, go on, don't sin again, but I don't condemn you. And that's a great story for us to remember always. That sometimes what we think we are right in judging, we may not be. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 7, at verse 1, and the real translation of that word is, don't condemn others. Do not judge. The word judge can also be translated as condemn. Here's a clear command. Do not condemn others. Otherwise, you'll be condemned yourself. Because with the same standard with which you condemn somebody else in one area, maybe you're in okay in that area, so you can condemn that person and say, hey, you're wrong there. But God will use that same standard to judge you somewhere else, in another, in another area where you're not so perfect. So, by the standard, verse 2, with which you measure out to others, it will be measured to you. This is a very important word for all of us to remember. Because we live in a world of imperfect Christians. You know, all of us sitting here are imperfect Christians. Not one is perfect. If uh, Maybe some people look perfect because you see only 1% of their life. But if you live with them every day, you'll discover that everybody sitting here, including me, we are imperfect. By that, by that I mean we are not fully like Jesus Christ. Perfection is like Christ, and we are not like Christ, none of us. And that's the main reason why we should be merciful. Because it says here, why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye and don't notice the log, verse 3, in your own eye? So don't condemn, and don't condemn yourself. If you're convicted about something, be quick to acknowledge it and uh, say, Lord, forgive me, cleanse me. And righteousness, I come clothed with the righteousness of Christ. That's the opposite of condemnation. Now, the reason I say this is because I've seen with many, many people, many believers, even in CFC, if they're honest, they will say that in our pursuit of righteousness, we condemn ourselves and they'll say that in the old days when we never pursued after victory over sin, we were not bothered about victory, we knew we were defeated and we never sought for victory and we would just ask the Lord to cleanse us and get us to move on. There was no condemnation then. It's true. Many people who in other churches who don't even preach about victory over sin and have no desire to give up sin in their life, they seem to live without condemnation. They're not condemning us themselves. They, I mean, there's sin in their life. They say, yeah, we are sinners. Uh, we slip up every day in numerous ways and the blood of Jesus cleanses us. Now that is a false peace and a false comfort. We don't want that. But at the same time, we don't want to go to the other extreme. See, always in the narrow way, there are two extremes. One is this where we say, I'm not under condemnation. The blood of Jesus takes care of me. I may sin 25 times a day, but it's okay, I'll keep on sinning till Christ comes. And uh, I'm cleansed in the blood of Christ, I'm accepted, I'm saved once, I'm saved forever. And he looks happy. What a shock he will get when Christ comes again. And he discovers that he was probably not even saved. His attitude to sin indicated that he was not saved. See, one mark of a person who has repented is not that he stopped sinning, no, but his attitude to sin has changed. By that you can make out whether you have really repented, all of you. Please examine yourself. It's not that you've stopped sinning. That will not happen till Christ comes. 
but your attitude to every sin has changed, even the smallest little thing. You get convicted. It may take you many years to overcome something, it doesn't matter, but your attitude to it is, I will never tolerate that in my life. If you have that attitude, you have really repented. But don't condemn yourself. Because we live in a flesh in which dwells nothing good. And God in his great wisdom, when we got converted, did not remove the flesh. I've sometimes thought about that. When we were converted, that desire for sinning which we had before is gone. We still sin, but the desire for it is gone. It's one mark of being born again. That's called the old man. The old man is this desire to sin all the time. That's gone. The old man is killed. There's a new man that's come inside us when we are born again that does not want to sin. It may sin, but that's because it's not strong enough. It's like I often use the illustration of this. The lusts in the flesh are like a gang of robbers who are coming to the door of your heart saying, let me in, let me in. I want to steal your joy, I want to steal your peace, I want to steal your purity, I want to steal everything that's good, everything that's godly, I want to steal it. And the old man, in the olden days, when you we were unconverted, said, yeah, come right in. And the old man was like a servant who would just open the door and say, come in, and all these lusts come in and make us commit all types of sins. But then one day God killed the old man when we were born again. And now we are a new man. The old man is the one who wanted to sin. Now, and now we don't want to sin. See, when people come to me for baptism, the question I ask is, do you want to sin again? Not will you sin. That nobody can say, I'll never sin. Do you want to? Want to, that's the question. Do you want to sin again? Do you want to live a holy life? That want to is the new man. Not, I will not sin, but I don't want to sin. I hope you understand the difference. If you understand that, there's no condemnation. I don't want to sin. That's a new man. So even though the new man doesn't want to sin, when these lusts come in, how do they come in then? They come in because the new man is not strong enough to keep the door shut. He wants to keep it shut, but he's weak. Why is he weak? He doesn't eat. He doesn't exercise. He doesn't read the Bible. He's not quick to acknowledge whenever the Holy Spirit convicts him. So he's weak. So if you don't read the scriptures, and you're not quick to set right a sin that you committed by confessing it to God or asking forgiveness from someone, you'll never become strong. See, that's the way we get muscles. You need two things. You need to eat food and you need to do exercise to be strong. So the new man doesn't keep the door shut and so the lust still come in. So that's how believers sin. But there's a difference because believer doesn't want to sin, but he still sins. Then he condemns himself. So the thing we need to do is say, Lord, I want to strengthen this new man. I want to read God's word and be strong. That's how we will make progress. And then there is no condemnation. Now turn with me where Paul, Paul is such a wonderful example. You see, the reason why God has given us two examples in the New Testament, Jesus, who said, follow me, many times, and Paul also said, follow me. As I follow Christ in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 1, Philippians 3.17, Paul said, follow me. And not only me, he says, all these others who have walking in the same way, follow me. It's a great example. Was he saying that because he was perfect? No. In the same Philippians 3, he says, I'm not perfect. How can a man who's not perfect say, follow me? Yeah, Paul had the boldness to say that. I'm not become like Christ, but I say, follow me because I'm following him. It's like saying that, Jesus has reached the top of the mountain. He's perfect. I haven't reached there. I'm climbing, but you can see my footsteps. You can follow me. We're going in the same direction. And you know, anyone who you are spiritually older than, spiritually more mature than, you should be able to say to that person, follow me as I'm following Christ. Follow me as I'm following Paul, who's following Christ. Or follow me as I'm following this brother, who's following Paul, who's following Christ. It's a stream of people climbing this mountain towards perfection. And you see anybody in that line who's pursuing perfection, follow that example. 
So in Romans chapter 8, see what it says. Again that word condemnation. There is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Or as King James Version also says, who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. Yeah, that means who do not want to sin, in other words. There is no condemnation. If you don't want to sin, there is no condemnation. And yet, see, we must see the previous verse always. And sometimes the chapter division makes us forget that there is a verse before it. Listen to this. The last part of, of 25, 725. On the one hand, with my mind, I serve the law of God. That means... With my mind, I don't want to sin even once for the rest of my life. I think that's true of most of us here. But I find, on the other hand, the law of sin is still in my members, and I'm sinning occasionally. I don't want to, but I do it. But there is no condemnation. How is that? It's amazing. With my mind, I'm serving the law of God. With my flesh, the law of sin, but still there's no condemnation. Because it depends on which direction your mind is set. If you understand this, you'll be free from condemnation for the rest of your life. And it will liberate you. It's liberated me. I'll tell you what it's liberated me from for many, many years now. From condemnation and from discouragement. Condemnation always brings discouragement. And I used to be one of the most discouraged people in the early years of my Christian life before I understood what it is to be filled with the Holy Spirit and what the new covenant was all about. And I understood the distinguished distinction between walking in the Holy Spirit and obeying God's convictions and yet recognizing I have a flesh in which dwells no good thing. So I want to try and explain this in a little way to you so that it will deliver you from condemnation. Remember, condemnation is a weapon of Satan with which he will try to n prevent your progress in the Christian life. Year after year after year, you'll find you're sitting in the same class, defeated by the same sins, because you're condemning yourself. And the devil is called the accuser of the brethren. He's there to accuse you day and night. And he will try and put that spirit in you so that you begin to accuse others. Beware of the spirit of accusing others, particularly in areas where you think you're okay. You will never speak against another person in an area where you yourself are defeated. Supposing you're defeated in some areas, you'll never criticize people who are doing that. But you think of the areas where you're not defeated. And those are the areas where you tend to criticize others. But the Lord says, before you do that, see if you have never sinned in any area without sin. Then open your mouth. Otherwise, keep your mouth shut. I'll tell you something. It's much safer to keep your mouth shut. Much, much safer. You'll progress a lot in your Christian life if you stop making accusations against others, stop condemning others, and use your mouth to bless others, to say something that will encourage them. Instead of always looking for some fault to find in somebody to tear them down. And very often if you examine your heart you'll find that it's because you got something against that person. That you say that. Not that you hate him but, or her. But you don't like that person. And because you don't, not very happy for some reason. Maybe that person said something against you or your family or something like that and you've never forgotten it. Oh, it's terrible. This memory can destroy your life. You've got to say, well, I'm going to forgive that person. I'm not even going to bother about what that person said. Okay. Treat them like a little child who did something stupid. We don't hold something against a child because they did something stupid. I'll tell you, your life will progress tremendously Please listen, if you learn one quality, what's written at the back here, be merciful to others, 
just as God has been merciful to you. I remember we had this in the old building as well. And um, when Brother Ian was asking me what verse should be put up there at the back, I said, do you know the biggest temptation that people pursuing holiness have? We preach holiness perhaps more than any other church in Bangalore or perhaps even India. in India. What is the biggest temptation for people who pursue holiness? I said, it is being unmerciful to others. Where do I learn that? From the Pharisees. I mean, the sinful people in uh, Israel did not want to condemn that woman caught in adultery. It's the Pharisees. Those who pursue righteousness, like us, are the ones who are in greatest danger of being unmerciful and condemning others. And we, we are the ones who need to hear Jesus saying, he who is without sin, cast the first stone. Have you heard it? I've heard it clearly. It doesn't mean I don't correct people. I have children who grew up in my home. Of course I corrected them. I didn't say I'm correcting you because I'm perfect. No. It's because God gave me a responsibility as a father to correct them. But I never go around correcting other people's children because God has not given me that responsibility. But the other area is when, if I'm an elder in a church, I have to correct people. And that may include children as well sometimes. Because I have responsibility over them as an elder. Then I have a responsibility to correct them. And as far as possible to correct them privately. Not to humiliate them publicly. I mean, even my own children, I would never humiliate them before guests and pub punish them publicly. No, that would be bad. So we must recognize before you pass an opinion on someone or try to correct someone, is that person under your authority? Do you have some responsibility for that person? Maybe you're a manager or a supervisor in a factory or an office then you have to correct people under you. Yes. You have to rebuke them, correct them, even fire them from the job if they are inefficient. That's okay. The question you need to ask yourself is, has God given you some authority over that person? You're a father or a mother, definitely over your children. But don't go judging other people's children. God has not given you any responsibility for them. If you want to pray for them, that's fine. But don't, don't judge them and condemn them. So often we have opinions in our mind. We can't help that. We need to have opinions, otherwise we don't have discernment. We need to discern, is this person, for example, people come to join our church. As an elder, I need to have discernment. What type of person is this guy? What is he coming for? But I don't have to judge him. I don't have to condemn him. And you may have opinions of different people in the church, but you don't have to express them. The moment you express them, you're condemning someone as if you're a perfect person and you have no authority over that person. It's very, very important, dear brothers. And if you follow this, I'll tell you, you yourself will be free from condemnation and you'll go from, you'll get promoted from one standard to another standard in the Christian life. And if you find that some of you are not making progress in your own Christian life, ask yourself, is it because the spirit of condemnation is there in you, which is condemning you? and you're condemning others. So, how is it with Paul? He said, in my flesh is the law of sin, but in my mind is the law of God. That's why there's no condemnation. In my mind, I never want to sin again. But this flesh makes me, sometimes when I don't even want to do it, I lose my temper. Or I don't want to do it, and I slip up. So that's what Paul says. Let me read to you from Romans 7 the previous chapter, which leads to Romans 8, verse 1. It's very important to understand, this is a very, very difficult passage for many people who try to interpret it. I'll tell you what most Christians say. Most Christians say, when Paul says, let me read this first to you. Romans seven fourteen onwards. We know the law is spiritual, but I am a flesh sold into bondage to sin. Not I'm sold into bondage to sin. My flesh is sold into bondage to sin. That's what he's saying. 
I am a flesh which is sold into bondage to sin. What I am doing, I don't understand. I am not practicing what I would like to do. I am doing the very thing I hate. <clears throat> do you find yourself in agreement there? That sometimes you do the thing you hate and you are doing what you don't want to do? And verse 16, if I do the thing I don't want to do, then I agree with the law that it is good. And if that is the case, it's not I doing it. It's not me doing it. It's sin which dwells in me doing it. It's not me. <clears throat> and then he says, I know that nothing good dwells in my flesh. The willing is present. That means I want to do it. But the actual doing, I can't do it. You find yourself in agreement there? The good that I want to do, I don't do. The very evil that I don't want to do, I end up doing. And if that's the case, I'm doing what I don't want to do, then it's not me, it's sin that dwells in me. So then he says, I find a principle. I want to do good. I agree with the law of God, verse 22. But I find another law in my members, always warring against this law of my mind and making me a prisoner to that other law of sin. Oh, wretched man that I am, how will I ever be set free? Now, I'll tell you what most Christian Bible scholars and preachers and everybody else say. They say that is Paul describing his unconverted life. It's not true. Be honest. Don't some of those verses refer to you and me? And that's because people have not been careful in studying the scriptures. Paul writes the book of Romans very systematically. He doesn't jump from 6th standard to 4th standard, no. From 6th standard he goes to 7th standard. What I mean is from Romans 6 he goes to Romans 7. And Romans 6 here, this wonderful verse which says, Sin will not have dominion over you, Romans 6.14. You're not under law, you're under grace. You come there. And then what's he doing in chapter 7? Going back? No. He's going progressively. I'll tell you how Romans is. Romans chapter 1, the world full of sinners. Romans chapter 2, religious people are sinners. Romans chapter 3, all are sinners. And Romans chapter 4, we are justified in Christ. Romans chapter 5, we are accepted by God. The blood of Christ has cleansed us. Good. Then you go further. Romans chapter 6. Now we go to another step. Sin does not rule over us. We are going higher and higher. And Romans 8, we come to a wonderful life in the Holy Spirit. In between is Romans 7. He's not going backwards. He's going forwards. Romans 7 comes after. Sin shall not have dominion over you. <clears throat> so then how do you understand Romans 7? One simple sentence. <clears throat> Let me show it to you in Romans 7. Then you'll understand Romans 7 and you'll understand today more than what many Bible scholars have understood. Romans 7.15 What I'm doing I do not understand. That is the introduction to all that he says in those verses. In other words, he says I'm not agreeing with it. I'm not agreeing with what I'm doing. I hate it. It is unconscious sin in me that's making me do it. So in our life, there are two types of sin. One is conscious sin. That means when you do it, you know it is wrong. Then there's unconscious sin, which makes you sometimes do something without even realizing it. Then afterwards, hey, you realize it's wrong. But it's almost something you don't have control over. And in all of us, there is unconscious sin, which we discover more and more as we walk with the Lord. So now let me read that passage. He says, I don't understand it. Because there's something in me that's making me do what I never want to do. I hate it. And... If I hate it, that means I agree with God's law. So there's something in me, he says, this flesh in which dwells nothing good. And that, when he thinks about that, as I just read it, 
he feels so bad about it. He says, I'm such a wretched man. How will I ever be free? If you constantly have a longing to be free from all sin, you're on the right path. Never condemn yourself. If a day comes in your life when you don't have a longing to be free from all sin, 100%, backsliding has started. That's the way to judge yourself. Not that you're actually free from sin, but you have a longing to be free from every single unchristlike thing in your life. My definition of sin is from Romans 3, 23. The clearest definition of sin in the whole Bible. Romans 3, 23 says, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That is sin. Sin is not just telling lies or having dirty thoughts. It's anything less than the perfect glory of God is sin. And John 1.14 says the glory of God was seen in Jesus Christ. So you put these verses together. It means anything less than the life of Jesus Christ is sin. So... That's why the Bible says we'll have sin in us until the day Christ comes. When he comes, we will be like him. Then I'll be completely free from sin. But until that day, there's going to be sin in me. But not, I'm not going to live in conscious sin all the time. Unconscious. So, I always acknowledge I'm not yet like Christ, but I'm not satisfied. It's like a student saying, I've not finished high school yet. I've not graduated but I'm not sitting in the same standard. I think, you know, school life is a perfect example of spiritual growth. We all come into school or we are born again, we come into the kindergarten. We're just born again. Many things we don't know, we're defeated by many things, but we don't want to sin. It's like a child who's come to school and he wants to study, but there are a million things he does not know. And so when you are born again, there are many things we don't even know our sin. It's okay. You're just joined in the kindergarten. Just make sure that you don't sit in the kindergarten year after year. That's all. Make progress. You should, just like you know you want your child to go from kindergarten to first standard next year, you should also have a longing, Lord, I'm at a certain level today. I want to move on. There must be some sins in my life that I conquer by next year. And when I go through next year, there must be some sins that I conquer even further. Ultimately, a day will come and I'll be free from all sin. But it's not sudden. It's progression. How does a student learn all that is taught in high school, 12th standard, or in a degree course? It's not sudden. It's through many years, 12, 15 years of study, then they get a degree. So it's like that in the Christian life. So until then... The student has to say, yeah, I can read now. I know the spelling of different words. Good. I can add, but I don't know how to subtract. I don't know division. Fine. And then another year says, hey, now I know about division. Now I know about multiplication. But he says, no, I still haven't learned square root. Okay, fine. Wait another year, you learn that as well. See, there's a progression. It's just the same way in our life. We are defeated by certain sins. That's like saying, I don't know that subject. But then a year goes by and say, hey, that's not in my life anymore. It must be like this, dear brothers and sisters, in your life. That each year finds you a little higher than the previous year. But you'll never be completely free. That's what Paul is saying here. With my mind, I'm serving the law of God. But in my flesh, the law of sin is still keeping me defeated in certain areas. Let me show you another verse. In 1 Corinthians, in chapter 3, my whole purpose this morning is to deliver you from a false sense of condemnation, but not to deliver you from conviction of sin. To distinguish between conviction of sin and the condemnation which is from the devil. We don't want that. See what Paul says in 1 Corinthians, in chapter 4. It's an amazing testimony. This is the same man who said, with my flesh I'm serving the law of sin. 
in Romans 7, with my mind, the law of God, the same man says in verse 4, 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 4, I am conscious of nothing against myself. We should be able to say that always, right now. I can say that. I'm conscious of nothing against myself. What does it mean? The word conscious, that means in my unconscious area, there may be so many things I don't even know which are unchristlike. but in the conscious area, I'm not aware of any sin that I've not confessed or any sin that I'm indulging in right now. I'm not aware of anybody I hurt whom I did not ask forgiveness from. I'm not aware of any sin that I committed which I did not ask the Lord to cleanse me from. I'm conscious of nothing, zero. Is it possible to live such a life? Yes. That's what we preach in the church. That at all times I should be able to say I'm conscious of nothing because I confess sin immediately. It's like saying, you know, if a thorn gets into my foot, I take it out immediately. I don't wait even two minutes to take out a thorn that's got into my foot. If a mosquito comes and bites my hand, I strike it off immediately. I don't wait for two minutes. I don't even wait one second. You know, we always do that. When it's a mosquito or a thorn, we get rid of it immediately. We must treat sin like that. Immediately, Lord, I'm sorry I did that. That thought came to my mind, forgive me, forgive me. And if you're quick to do that, you'll find you can say at all times, I'm conscious of nothing against myself. Maybe you have to ask forgiveness from somebody else as well. If you have to ask forgiveness from somebody whom you hurt and you haven't asked that forgiveness, you cannot say, I'm conscious of nothing against myself. How can you say that? You are conscious. There's somebody you hurt you have not asked forgiveness from. Or somebody you cheated and you haven't returned the money. How can you say, I'm conscious of nothing? But those who are quick to immediately set matters right, and that's how Paul was. So I'm conscious of nothing, but, now listen to the second part of that sentence. But, 1 Corinthians 4, 4, that does not mean that I'm free. That does not mean God says, okay, there's nothing wrong in you. I can't say there's nothing wrong in me. I'm not acquitted because someone greater than me is, I'm examining myself, but the one who examines me is the Lord. Verse 4. And he sees things in me which I don't see. But he doesn't condemn me for that. It's like you don't condemn a first standard student. Hey, you don't know calculus and you don't know trigonometry and you don't know all these. Why should he feel condemned? It's not taught that in first standard. In first standard, you only have to know the subjects taught in first standard. And you don't have to condemn yourself that you don't know the other things which your elder brother in sixth standard knows. No. So he says, in, in my conscious area, I'm clear. And this helps us very much in judging others as well. See, if you recognize this, we realize in that growth, all of us are at different levels. I'm at one level, you're at another level, your wife is at another level, your husband is at another level. So what does that mean? Spiritually speaking, supposing your husband is in sixth standard and the wife is in third standard. That means she's keeping everything clear according to her conscience. She's getting 100% in third standard. That's where she is. And the husband is keeping everything clear, but he's in sixth standard, spiritually speaking. Now he can look at his wife and see something completely wrong in her, which she's doing or saying, and he can judge her. He should not do that. Because he's judging her by sixth standard level. He doesn't recognize that she's not in my class. That's where there's need for mercy towards everybody. I hope I'm not too complicated, but I'll tell you, this has liberated me. And if you understand it, it'll liberate you. I'm not here to judge that person because I don't know which class he's in. God is the only one who knows. I have to make sure that I get 100% in the class I'm in. I hope. I hope he's getting 100% in the class he's in. I presume he is. If it is something obvious, I mean, there are things which are so obviously sin, like the old covenant 
don't steal, don't kill, those are obvious things. I'm not talking about those things. I'm talking about areas of unconsciousness where people don't know whether this is wrong or not. That's where we need to be merciful. That's why I said the people who pursue righteousness are in greatest danger of being unmerciful towards others. And you find that lack of mercy in married relationships where husbands can be very unmerciful to their wives and they slip up somewhere or wives can be very unmerciful to their husbands and they slip up somewhere and there's unhappiness in the home because they just don't understand this one thing. There is no condemnation. You are condemning your partner but God is not condemning that partner because God says, you're in the sixth standard, she's in the third standard. You can condemn her, but I don't condemn her. Imagine condemning a wife whom God does not condemn. That's the tragedy. So many people don't understand that. That's what Romans 7 verse, that verse 14 down to the end of the chapter is all about. And that's how it ends in Romans 8.1. There is no condemnation. There's no condemnation for me. And I don't go around condemning others. I'm here called to, what is the meaning of prophecy? Prophecy means to speak to, you read that in 1 Corinthians 14.3, to encourage people, to challenge people, and to build them up. That's all I'm supposed to speak. All it says, covet to prophesy, long to prophesy. That means long to speak words that will challenge others to a higher standard of life. Encourage them if they are discouraged or gloomy and build them up. What is condemnation? Condemnation is tearing them down, accusing them and holding them to a higher standard than they can possibly live and judging them by the level God has led me to. It's exactly like a 10th standard student asking a 1st standard student, why don't you understand the things that I understand? I'll tell you, because he's in 1st standard. So who's the stupid person there? The stupid person is a 10th standard student who's think, expecting the first standard student to know all that. And I really believe so many people who are pretty holy in their lives are pretty stupid because they judge others. They condemn others. Even if they don't say it with their lips, inwardly they condemn them. I know because I was like that once. I thank God I'm free from it. <laughs> and you know, I've discovered that when I stop condemning others, God stops treating me like that as well. He, he sets me free in many areas. It's a tremendous liberation. And if you don't believe it, try and practice it from today and see if it, what happens in your life. Your life will suddenly rise to a much higher level than you have ever experienced till now. And you'll stop condemning yourself. You'll understand that in the conscious area, I must be 100% free from sin. God expects you to get 100% in the kindergarten, if that's where you are. But God expects you after one year to go to first standard. And then he expects you to get 100% in first standard. It's progression. But don't judge other people by your standard. It's very simple. I don't know how many times I have to repeat it. But I tell you, if you do this, you'll stop condemning yourself, you'll stop condemning others, and you'll be able to prophesy that is, whenever you speak to people, whether on, this, on your phone or whether you write an email to them or speak to them in conversation, you'll always seek to encourage, challenge, or build them up, not tear them down. So many people are tearing people down because they are judging others by their own standard. If I can do this, why can't you do it? I'll tell you, because that person is three standards lower than you. That's why you can't do it. But so often, that's what we're doing. And there are so many people coming to CFC who are discouraged because there are other people condemning them. Brothers, don't be like that. If someone comes here and they don't, they're not up, to, up at your level, do something to, maybe you're in postgraduate, you're doing master's degree, okay, fine, praise the Lord. But that poor boy or girl is in second standard. Please try and help them to come to third standard. They will not come to your master's degree standard overnight. Just lift them up a little bit. Encourage them. Encourage them. Challenge them. 
Show them how wonderful Jesus is. Help them to see the glory of Jesus and lift them up. It's a tremendous ministry that every one of you can do. Don't leave it just to the preachers and the leaders and the elders. No, how can elders deal with a congregation like this? It's impossible. If every one of us who knows the Lord to some extent, I'm not saying you've got to encourage everybody, but in this church, aren't there a few people whom you know? Maybe a small circle, maybe five people. Out of 600 people, you know five. Fine. When you meet those five people you're very close to, what do you do? Do you encourage them? Challenge them? Share with them something that will build them up? Or do you gossip and speak evil about this person, that person, and that doesn't help anybody, it doesn't change those people? What are you accomplishing with all this gossip? Except tearing down somebody's character. That's all. I say, if you can't help somebody, keep your mouth shut. Somebody's ch children are going astray. Okay, can you help them? Please help them. Or pray for them. Otherwise, just to criticize them and say, look at these parents, how bad they are. How does it help that poor boy? And how does it help the parents? That's not challenging or encouraging or building up. It's tearing down and discouraging and doing everything opposite of what the Bible says. That's against the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit challenges, encourages and builds up. But we are discouraging and tearing them down. Do you know that many believers are fighting against the Holy Spirit in their life? And they wonder, why is my life not more victorious? I'll tell you, because you're fighting against the Holy Spirit in other areas. Those who pursue righteousness the most are the ones very often who are most unmerciful. If you went to Israel in the days of Jesus, the people who, were, who thought they were the most holy were the Pharisees. And they were very upright in many areas. They were very exact in paying the tithe and keeping the law and all that. But they were the ones who condemned others the most. Let's not be like that. Let's have that balance of truth plus grace. Of severity plus goodness. And you've often heard me quote this verse. The balance there is in God that we need to have in Isaiah 61. Let me repeat it for those who have forgotten or those who have never heard it. Isaiah 61. And speaking about Jesus, because Jesus quoted this verse in Luke 4, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. The word of God, the gospel is always good news. The word gospel means good news. We should never go with bad news from the Bible. The Bible is full of good news to those who are afflicted, to bind up the brokenhearted. What a tremendous passage this is. If you really want to be anointed with the Holy Spirit, follow this. Lord, anoint me, not to speak in tongues, but to bring good news to the afflicted people around me, to bind up those who are brokenhearted around me, to proclaim liberty to somebody here who is in bondage to something, and to proclaim freedom to those who are in a prison here. There are invisible prisons in which people are sitting. Set them free. And then, verse 2, to proclaim the favorable year of our Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. There is a day of judgment. But notice this, verse 2, 365, years of, 365 days of favor and one day of judgment. That's the proportion. With God, verse 2, that is 365 days of favor and one day of judgment. I say, Lord, I want to have that proportion. I don't want zero day of judgment. There has to be judgment against sin, sure. I must be strict, even with my children. But it must be 365 to 1, not 50-50. No, some people think 50-50. 50% pay grace and 50% judgment. No. 365 to 1. That's what it says here. And that's the proportion we must have. And I believe if we go this way, we'll find ourselves making tremendous spiritual progress in our own life, being free from condemnation, and 
being merciful to others and delivering other people from the prisons they are in, lifting up the depressed. And there are many people sitting here who are probably need a word of encouragement. I love that beautiful passage in Luke where it says Peter was in the courtyard and Jesus was in the court being judged, judged by the high priest and all the others. And Peter denied the Lord three times. And the cock crew. And it says there in Luke, Jesus turned and looked at Peter. It's a beautiful word. The Lord turned and looked at Peter. Now the question is, what was he saying with that look? You know, sometimes you can say something with a look. You know that. The way you look can be a stern look or an encouraging look. What was Jesus saying to Peter with that look? Was he saying, I told you you would do this? No. I think that look was saying, it's all right, Peter. Just conf confess it, I forgive you, let's move on. Let's move on, I've got a plan for your life. That's why he went out and wept bitterly and became the great apostle that he became. Because the Lord encouraged him. And I want to say, my brothers and sisters, there may be somebody waiting for a look like that from you. Maybe your husband or a wife, when they do something wrong, when they slip up. How do you look? Ah, oh, there you went and messed up that again. I hope that look will never be in our face. Because God never looks at us like that. Do you ever think God is looking at you saying, Ah, oh, there you went and messed up there again. Never. Let's have a look which says, it's okay. Let's fix it. Something got broken, it's all right. It's not, the world has not collapsed because of that. It's not serious. The only thing serious is sin. And that also you can confess and forsake it. Dear brother, sister, be a person like that from today onwards and people will want to come and talk to you. People will want to come and meet you. Because they realize that every time they meet you, they are encouraged. Imagine if all of us become like that. What a church this will become. We're not lowering the standard of sin. But we are balancing that strictness against sin with 365 days of favor. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, please help us to understand your mercy more. To understand your kindness, and your goodness, and your long suffering. How your mercies are new every morning. Help us to also have mercies that are new every morning to people who have failed. As you have been merciful to us. Help us to be free from condemnation 100%. And not to condemn others, but to lift them up. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.